Hi, welcome. This is Dr. John Martini. This is one of the most amazing and inspiring shows that you can listen into. If you want to be on the edge of your seats, if you want to open up your heart, if you want to expand your mind, and you want to meet incredible people, stay tuned because you're just about to experience a transformative radio show that will change your life. And you're listening to the Dr. Pat Show is coming up right next. Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Talk radio to thrive by. Powerful, inspiring, and coming to you live, bringing you stories of people like you and me, busting through and living life full out. Get ready to dare to wonder what your life would be like if you knew you could not fail. Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's so great to have all of you tune us in and turn us on. I, I got... I got to tell you, um, some days I have to pinch myself a bit and I, I wake up with the realization because I don't think about this that often. I don't think about forming a network, expanding a network. 20 years, the Dr. Pat show started out. At, I do think about crust busting though, Benny, I will say that, but I don't, I don't, it's not like every minute of my day is about that. But here's what I do think about. I think about the honor that the universe and spirit has bestowed on me that allows me to have conversations with people like my very special guest today. Um, Paul, Paul, Paul Levy, and the one I just had with Catherine Hudson, right? But I think about how perfectly and divinely orchestrated my life has been, despite kicking, screaming, resisting, shadow, 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 addictions, recovery, suicides in my family. And here we are. But I think about what it is that Paul has saying in this, his latest encounter, if I might say. And I think about this, these two words. I just love this. Now, this is not the only two words. We're talking about healing. Mind virus. I love that. Why do I love that? I don't know. Maybe today I just love it. But this is about looking at spiritual traditions as Paul has done over and over and over again. And looking at the, the symbolization, looking at the pathogen, as he calls it, of the psyche. Yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 that is like, so like, we got to put that like on the pathogen of the psyche. Because see, the pathogen of the psyche showed up at the Oscars yesterday. <laughs> Now, I know Paul is not here to talk about the Oscars with me, or maybe he is, but we, we are here to talk about something special. We are here, and I'm going to hold it up, right? And Because, Benny, we have a copy of the book. And, Jacob, can you all see that right there? I say Waitiko. I don't know if that's what it is, but that's the way I say it. Some people say we. I say we, Tico. And this is, this is a follow-up to a body of work that allows us to talk about what we cannot see, sort of a blindness, right? But it's more than that. It's how do we have this projection that comes forward, that fuels this with Tico. How has it been fueled in the, how, how has this been, how, when we look at the, the events of the world right now, including last night. So when we look at COVID-19, when we look at the economic downturn, when we look at the war in the Ukraine, right? And the update that I want to give you is um, a parliamentary member, uh, Euras, is now on the line. He's in the field and he's got a gun in his hand and he is fighting 
So he's not doing a lot more interviews like the one he did. But when we look at this, what is the one thing that many thought leader scholars and my very special guest today would point to to be the cure? You're going to be blown away when you hear it because it is the thing that we we get as children. We get this as children until somebody tells us no. Paul, great to have you. Welcome to the show. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here with you. Really, thank you so much for the invite. Um, I was reading through the book, and you know, I, I love Larry, and, and I, I love the way that the book opens, right? Um, I love the way that people are able to look at a body of work you've done. This is not new, but mm -hmm. look at it and, and really acknowledge that you're taking this, and I'm going to call it an energy. You're taking an energy, uh, energy, entity, whatever you're doing, you're taking it and you're looking at where we are today and you're saying, oh, I think I might know what's going on. Talk about Watiko. Yeah. Let's introduce everybody. Sure. Well, the thing about Watiko, I mean, it's getting out all over the world. People are more and more talking about it. And it's an indigenous term that really um, connotes this cannibalistic spirit, kind of the spirit of evil. But I point out that it's quantum in nature, that it also in hit, it, it, it um, includes hidden within it its own vaccine. And not only does it contain its own medicine, it's actually helping us to wake up if we recognize what it's showing us. But if we don't have the recognition of what, of what it's offering us about ourselves, then it'll destroy us. So um, it can be likened to this, like you were saying, this, this, this virus of the mind. And, um, and so many people are talking about it. There's like a mental virus and it's at the bottom of the collective psychosis. Yeah. It is literally at the bottom of all the collective madness that we're playing out in our world, you know, in collective events, in our lives, within our own mind. And um, so we've made it a huge discovery that I'm just a translator. Every spiritual tradition from time immemorial has been pointing at Watiko. It's in the apocryphal text. They call it the counterfeiting spirit because it, it's, you know, it has no creativity, but it's a master impersonator. It puts us on, it fools us. And then when we identify with its fictitious version of ourselves, then it has us, then it can manipulate and control us. But when we're in touch with our nature, with who we actually are, it has no power over us. And um, so just a few other things, just as, as a good sort of segue into a deeper discussion. Yeah. It's actually, it works through the projective tendencies of the mind, because we're always projecting onto the inkblot of the waking of waking life. And it works through the part of us that has these blind spots. It's a form of blindness, but it's a form of blindness that doesn't realize it's blind. And, you know, so, um, but like I'm saying, encoded in it, it's actually potentially helping us. That's why my whole work is trying to, to really show people what, you know, it's at, like I'm saying, it's at the bottom yeah. of the evil, of the madness. It's a collective psychosis. And um, and the source of it is within our psyche. Yeah. You know, that's the thing. You know what I love about it? So here's the thing that I got this time around with you, because I watched, again, the new Matrix movie. It's like the Matrix. See, you're living oh, totally. in the Matrix, but you don't know. Right. Right. You're living in the Matrix. You don't know it's a Matrix because every day of your life is that reality of it until you get an inclination. A clue. Yep. That it's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And those those synchronistic clues, they're hidden within the fabric of the multidimensional cosmos that we live in. And and, you know, it's interesting, the matrix, because that's a perfect symbol, because what happens being that it's a collective psychosis, when so many, the majority of of people are under the spell of Watiko and um, and really what it is is that, you know, there's no objective Watiko virus that people should be afraid of. No, but we ourselves put ourselves under a spell via our own light. And when we're actually um, in a world where the overwhelming majority of people are under that spell, we're continually reinforcing our blindness and our insanity. 
And that creates the psychic epidemic, the collective psychosis that is that is Watiko. So it's as if our species has fallen under a spell and I'm trying to like help people to show, oh, here's how we can break the spell. You know, it's, it's like a fairy tale that we're yeah. living in. I want to read this from the forward of the book by Larry, Dr. Larry Dossie. We would love, you know, I, the, this is so beautifully said. Now, if we'd have done this show like last week, I would have had something different to say. But the fact that we're coming off of uh, 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 one of the most prestigious uh, uh, award ceremonies for artistic creation and film, and Watiko showed up. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm, I'm, sorry. I'm happy to talk I, about that. I mean, that well, just I want blew to my talk mind. About yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you think that something like the Oscars would be benign, but I got this question to ask you. Let me read this and I'm going to ask yeah, you. Yeah. Okay, so he goes on to say, Watiko says, uh, says Levy is a psychological force within the unconscious mind that predisposes us towards unwholesome impulses such as the thirst for power and control, greed, and jealousy. People who are possessed by Rutiko are deeply selfish. They seldom have any interest. Well, it's a, it's a stealth factor, he goes on to say. We rarely suspect its presence, even when it affects our own behavior. Yeah. Let's just take a quick look at behavior. Putin, Russia, Ukraine. That's like one thing. That's just one thing that that he was not the only thing. There were things that lead up to that. What happened on our Capitol doorstep, right? And then it hits Hollywood like that. Yeah. Well, can I say something about that? And you it's can so say funny. anything yeah. you want. Because it's so funny. I was just talking right before the Oscars to a friend of mine who was in Hollywood, Hollywood for 25 years you know, really accomplished in her field. And she stepped out of it because she was actually seeing the depth of the darkness that was informing a lot of Hollywood. So then I turn on the Oscars and that happens with Will Smith. And it was wild because, um, you know, just from my point of view, it was as if Will Smith got possessed by yeah. some sort of other force. And yet it was like he was playing a role in an action movie where he was the alpha male and protecting his woman and, you know, and all this stuff. And then just this, un, this, this like rage coming out of him once he sat down. And, you know, I don't know, it, it just like, you know, the, um, just the, the incredible um, reaction. And that's an example, like what Tico will, will exploit. We all have shadow tendencies, but all of a sudden it'll exploit our unconscious in a way where we indulge in the shadow tendencies and we feed them and then we act them out such that we become yeah. an instrument for, you know, for violence and aggression and hatred and evil in the world as compared to just, well, you know, Chris Rock makes this joke and like, oh, I'm triggered. Oh, let me deal with what's being triggered in me. Wow, that's kind of uncomfortable. That's a whole different thing. But it was like that never, that didn't happen. That parallel universe didn't happen. It was startling seeing that live play out. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because I, I will say this. Will Smith and the movie have been under attack for months now. The attacks have been on Venus and Serena Williams. I mean, honestly, so you have to ask yourself the question, right? When you're talking about the psyche, you know, he went through the last award ceremony and Jane, Jane Campion made a comment because well, the energy and the force we're talking about doesn't have any boundaries. You know, it doesn't say, oh, wait, I'm not going to do that. My friend texted me because we've been doing shows with some of the parliamentary members of the Ukraine, right, government. And my friend texted me this morning and says, hey, did you see this? That Russia got a bunch of really just really sustained heavy losses. And what they did is they just thought they would just run over the commander with the tank. What? <laughs> See, this is, this is what we look at in our world. My concern, help me with this. My concern 
is that we are going to get numb to it. What do you think? Yeah, well, I would say we've already gotten anesthetized and numb to it. I, I, I was mean, trying you know, not to, to admit that to myself. So call me denial today. Yeah, but that's a form we're having. We all have PTSD. We're all in trauma because the horrors of what are playing out in our world every day, there is no let up. It's 24 seven. You know, it, it's the natural response to just sort of shut off or split off or become numb. But that's what Tico, because then when you become numb, you turn a blind eye towards these, you know, towards the evil that's playing out. And what Tico is a form of blindness that when we turn a blind eye, it then we're feeding it, then we're strengthening it. And so that's why, you know, I'm not the only one. It's like seeing this as a dream, as a collective dream and interpreting it as such, which would be, you know, the language of dreams, you know, is to see it symbolically. And um, it's clear that, you know, the, the, the shadow, the darkness, both personal shadow for each one of us in our own relationship, in our own selves, and there's a collective shadow that is actually in our face. And I point out again and again that Watiko is this revelation. It's a living revelation. And just, you know, it's not that light just reveals darkness. Light, in this case, is revealing itself through the darkness. That's the point. And that's totally in the Kabbalah. That's in all the mystical texts of every tradition. That's what's happening. Yeah. And I love what you talk about this because you talk about, you know, consciousness and restored unity as well in the book. And what you said is so brilliant because there is so much light. I mean, we can spend. Will Smith was one event. And to be honest with you, I thought it was a joke. So I was still attached to acceptance speeches by by a man that could not speak, uh, by Lady Gaga's kindness to Liza Minnelli, by, you know, watching two of our prominent young people win an Oscar for a song, right, for Daniel Craig's. I mean, there was so much to, to really hold on to, you know, so much to honor in moments that my mind said, oh, that's a skit. They just planned a skit. So it wasn't until like later, like this morning, did the news hit me that that was like for real. Right, 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 totally. But you talk about a way out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to talk about the way out that you talk about because it is the one thing that kept my company, my passion, purpose, the expansion of our network, the Transformation Network, moving, elevating, growing, staying level in our consciousness. It is the one thing that my entire team did and got together. And I want to talk with you about it. And you mention it. Imagination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Like, I have a lot to say about that. In other words, because what I was thinking, oh. as you were sharing, <laughs> was that, you know, um, the real cure for Watiko, for all of the myriad, you know, the world crises that are converging on us, that are self-created, is for each one of us to connect with our creativity. We are these creative beings. We're made in the image of our creator. But to the extent we don't know we're creative, so we possess like this incredible superhero power that is ours 24-7. We already have it. We are it. And but to the extent that we're not consciously stepping into our cre creativity, it gets turned against us in a way that's killing us. And an example with that counterfeiting spirit in the apocryphal text, that is Watiko. And of course, it got edited out of the actual canon of the Bible, because yeah. I point out that Watiko was on the editorial board, you see, because it can't <laughs> stand to be seen. When you see it, when you see how it works through informing events in the world and through you know, triggering unconscious reactions in our minds, because it's non-local, it exists both out in the world and in our minds at the same time. When you see Watiko, you take away its power and you empower yourself. And then Watiko gets unemployed. So that's why it's always trying to hide itself. And I'm trying to shed light on it and say, look, here's how it works. Think about the counterfeiting spirit. It offers us a fictitious version of ourselves. Oh, I'm limited, I'm wounded, I'm traumatized. 
And then if we identify with its version of ourselves, we've given ourselves away, we've identified with who we're not, and we've disconnected from our creative power. You know, then what Tico is using our creative power against us, that's a recipe for madness. That's what Tico in a nutshell. And what that's pointing at is that the solution to our world crises is for individually, each one of us to connect with our nature. Our true nature is by its nature creative. The more we connect with our true nature, the more we embody being creative, and the more we express ourselves creatively, the more we know our nature in a self-reinforcing feedback loop that's positive, that actually creates light upon light, when not just one person is doing that, but when more and more of us are connecting with each other as we're doing that together, we can literally change the waking dream we're having, and that is to consciously step into our evolution we are actually then participating consciously in our own evolutionary wow. process. That's the solution. That's what's being revealed to us by the Watiko mind epic, you know, the, 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 the collective psychosis, the psychic epidemic. But if we don't get the message, just like a dream, we'll have a recurring dream and it'll just get amplified and amplified and, and more and more of a nightmare until we get the message. Something is being revealed to us. That's what I'm pointing at again yeah. and again. I love this because um, I love the chapter of the Masters of Deception. Right. Uh, I love that. There's a thing that you say here. You say uh, the you say the darker force, by whatever name we call it, can directly communicate with the mind, hiding under the cover of light. It can insert a lie into a per, a lie into a person's mind, and if the person's faculty of discernment is sufficiently disabled, which stress, by the way, does. Right. Uh, then uh, they can believe the lie to be true. Hello, three years of this, people are stressed. We've seen something that this generation has not seen. And so we're in a place now where we are down a court to allow the masters of deception. It's almost like inviting a vampire into your house. Yeah, well, what Tico, exactly what Tico is a vampire. So <laughs> one way of, of articulating what you were just saying is that the, the regulatory agencies of our mind, the immune system, the monitoring agencies, which are supposed to keep out invaders or toxins or like negative energies has been captured. There's been a regulatory capture. So here's what Tico, the mind virus that set up shop within our mind it's colonized our mind all under the cover of darkness. So we're oblivious to that. And then it sets up this shadow government inside our psyche. It dictates to the ego. And we unwittingly then become an instrument for, you know, for it to act itself out through us. Now, what I'm just describing, that's fascism. That's Young was totally, the great psychiatrist was totally onto Watiko. He didn't have the name. He called it totalitarian psychosis. Yeah. Now, what's that? What what Tico is? It's an inner disease of the soul that has this magical ability to extend itself out in the world, the outer world, and configure events in the world so as to reveal, express, and express the very state of the psyche that's under its thrall. What I just described, where the outer world is actually reflecting the inner psyche. That's exactly a description of a dream. You see, Watiko is a dreamed up phenomena. We are dreaming up the Watiko epidemic moment by moment. What that means is that we can learn how to undream it. But being a dreaming phenomena, Watiko is literally showing us the dreamlike nature. When we recognize the dreamlike nature, that's when we're beginning to wake up and that's when we're beginning to unlock the most cre incredible creative agency that we all possess, but we don't know we possess it. Yeah. And, you know, you go on. I want to talk about this when we come back from break, because, you know, you go on to really point out so many things. I mean, I've often wondered, you know, especially when I was younger and I found out the, about the book, According to Thomas, some people call it Q. You can call it anything you right. want to call it. Um, but I, I was always wondering you know, because I was introduced to it when I was younger. And now, of course, the introduction of it has gotten buried again. But I didn't understand it. And I would go to my pastor, or I would go, you know, I would just say, well, what about this? Well, can you talk about this? Now we have many books, 
Now we're looking at new messaging coming from Dead Sea Scrolls. Now we're dot, dot, dot. But when we come back, I want to talk to you about something because I think imagination cannot be silenced. And I want to ask you about this. Yeah, totally. Do we believe imagination is coming forward in some of the most interesting, not necessarily spiritually ways, but through our pop culture? What do we think of imagination and messaging? What if the light now has found a way to encourage us to new ways? What if we can all look at our anti antiviral treatment that is free and we have to stop disallowing ourselves from stepping into the world of imagination, creativity, innovation, spiritual connection, and will that work? Paul, before we go, yeah. uh, what's your website? Let's make sure people know how to get your website and how to yeah, get Yeah, sure. If book. people, if they want to awaken in the dream, they should go to awakenindthedream.com. And when we come back, we'll give a copy of the book away. Hey, anybody out there, do you relate to something that I'm about to say? Mind parasites. Well, you like that one? Wait till you hear what we, we're going to talk about when we come back, right? You, you got any of that going on up here? Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I'm so glad, Paul. Thank you so much. One more time. How do we get a copy of the book? How do we find out more about you? Uh, any and all things you do, because, you know, part of this is you also offer classes. There are other things outside of writing great books. Yeah. So they can just go to um, awakenindthedream.com. And there's a ton of stuff, you know, for free articles, interviews. I just want to get this information out because it's medicine. I love it. Um, and, you know, look, I was reading about, or, you know, and shared with the listeners. And Penny, let's give a copy of the book away. 1-800-930-2819. Say hi to Benny. And we'd love to give a first caller a copy of the book. But, you know, you take us on this journey, everything from taking a look at the mind and, you know, taking a look at, you know, the disrupting agencies to then asking the question, mind parasites, are we humans terminally insane or just waking up? Yeah. That's like a chicken and egg question, isn't it? Yeah. Well, the thing about <laughs> Watiko, Watiko is a quantum phenomena. You know, yeah. when I wrote a whole book about quantum physics, but in essence, yeah. what I mean when I say that is just, just like, you know, when you study the, what is the nature of light? Well, sometimes it manifests as a wave, sometimes as a particle. It depends how, you, how it's being observed. Same thing with Watiko. There's a superposition of states. It's the source of the greatest evil that can destroy us and the most sublime blessing and creativity. And it all depends on how, whether we recognize what it's revealing to us. And, um, you know, and then getting back to what you said about the, the imagination before, right before the break. Yeah. The thing is, the imagination is the greatest threat to Watiko. That's why it tries to destroy the imagination and we feel stuck or blocked or whatever. And, um, and that's why it's so important to cultivate, you know, the real imagination, not like alchemy talks about there's, there's the false imagination. No, the real imagination is interfacing with, you could say with God in that, um, you see, so many of us, we feel in our lives, we've had experiences that when we've stepped into our creativity and our imagination, we get squashed or judged or, you know, put down and then we, we shut it off. But if it's the true creativity and the true creative imagination, it, it can't be kept down for long. It'll find a new channel to express itself. And that's why it's so profoundly important. We're all artists. We're all creative artists. We're all actually these, these, these wounded healers in training. We're like shamans. Yeah. And, and I can go into that, you know, in great depth. But the point is, is that one of the, you know, the greatest danger in the world of shamanism or healers is if a person stays ignorant of their um, abilities to be a healer and to be a shaman. 
and to be an alchemist. And that's another way of talking about what I'm trying to bring forth in my work. You know, I love that you call out part of this uh, through the cancer of the soul. When you talk about a cancer of the soul, yeah, I want to make that connection. I want to make the connection between everything we've just talked about, and especially right. about the mind, to now talking about it being the cancer of the soul, especially when you reference, I, I think you call it the lie, the yeah. lie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Well, like, you know, the lie, that's that's Young's quote on describing shadow projection. Yep. He calls it the lie, and who's the liar but the devil? So in other words, like the when we scapegoat and and project out our own shadow, then we're in cahoots unwittingly with the devil. That's the that's the psycho psychological dynamic that underlies Watiko. And um, yeah, and then just think about in our world today with all the misinformation and the incredible lying, you know, and of course, then what happens, our minds get muddled. We can't discern what's true from what's what's not true. And it just creates confusion. And then because of that cognitive dissonance, we split or numb or become unconscious. And as soon as we do that, we then become a vector for Watiko to act itself out through us. And, you know, part of this, too, is you go on to talk about, you know, the implications of this. And one of them is uh, Watiko and, uh, and addiction. And I think we oh, need totally. to take a moment and talk about that because the rate of addiction and I, I say that term loosely, and my phrase includes now in the modern world, drugs, alcohol, food, digital media, like you cannot not sleep without your phone. That's like crazy. Like have right. your phone by your head. But addiction, is this the new playground for Watika? Yeah, well, it's not just like all those things you mentioned, but it's an addiction to our process or to our suffering or to our sense of identity, you know, it's endless. And I point out in my book, you know, that that addiction and that's related to trauma. You know, the two really are just two ways of talking about a similar thing. The thing which is so interesting is that when we're acting out our addiction or when we're in trauma, the way we act out actually is like within trauma, for example, we'll try to heal our trauma and we'll act out in a way that recreates the very trauma we're trying to heal from, just like addiction. Every time we enact our addiction, we're strengthening its hold over us in a self-reinforcing feedback loop. But we are said the origin of that process is ourselves. We are, you see, the thing about what Tico that I keep on trying to point out is that to shed light on how we're colluding with it, it has no power over us, but it hooks us through our blind spots such that we're complicit you know, and then we're unwittingly investing it with power over us when we're the ones who have, ultimately speaking, the power because people feel so helpless with what's happening in the world. That's the Watiko. That's the publicity campaign of Watiko. No, each one of us have this enormous creative power. That's what quantum physics discovered that, you know, being that this is a collective dream and that the act of observing this dream actually influences the dream, you know. I mean, that's the, the real essence of quantum physics. That's pointing out that the act of observation is creative, that we have this enormous creative power by how we interpret reality, the meaning we place on our experience. But because we're not awake to it, we feel victimized and we're, we feel like we're just passive observers. No, we're the dreamers. And once enough of us recognize that we can come together and it's what I call we can dream ourselves awake. And that I'm saying that's evolutionary. That's what this is all about. Um, let's talk about from your perspective. I, 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 people can read the book for sure. What do you see are our greatest challenges and our greatest gifts to wipe yeah. out the virus? I want to hear what you, where you, what you're thinking about from yeah. where we are right greatest, now today. Our greatest challenges as individuals is to deal with our own suffering and to deal mm -hmm. with our own pain and to deal with our own darkness. And to the extent we're genuinely doing that work, we're slowly um, like that cancer that's that's sort of doing this, you know, that's metastasizing through the greater body politic of the world, including our minds. When we're doing our work, we're alchemically transmuting that into light, into the light of our nature. 
Um, so on the one hand, there is that, you know, that's I, I see that as the greatest challenge and to not fall into despair and pessimism because there's overwhelming evidence that, oh, my God, things are really dark and we're going to hell in a, in a handbasket. So but as soon as we fall into pessimism, then we've unwittingly offered ourselves for, you know, to be a conduit for Watiko. And um, but the greatest, you know, the, the medicine of the blessing is for us to have the courage to really um, connect with our calling, being these wounded healer shaman sorts, you know, because that's the major archetype that's activated in the collective unconscious. And, you know, I can talk a lot more about that. But the idea is, is that do we have enough courage to assent and cooperate with our deeper calling? You know, we each have a role to play. And it, it's not like people have to write books or be on the world stage. No, just being a good person or good father or mother, that itself could be your role. But to, to really have the courage to connect, not with the version, the image of yourself that the world has told you you should be, but to actually step into who you actually are and find your mission, yeah. whatever that vocation is, that connects you with, you know, your inner guide and, you know, your guiding spirit, whatever you call it. And that then will introduce you to your creativity because creativity is not just something that's a personal thing or that you can access by your intellect or your conscious ego. No, it's actually, it's allowing yourself to be an, an instrument for something mm -hmm. to come through you. And when enough of us do that, and particularly when we connect with each other, that becomes a virus that's contagious, but it's a positive. It's an antivirus to the mind virus. Yeah. You know, let's talk about this a minute because I've done a couple of shows recently where uh, I've gotten uh, several emails from listeners and I'm going to paraphrase for you. One of them was, hey, Dr. Pat, you know, you've talked about purpose a lot and where from where you sit, it looks like you've got that going on. And I replied back to our, our listener and actually spoke with, with her. I used to clean bathrooms. I used to sell hot dogs. I used to do whatever I needed to do at different times in my life. And whatever people are doing, you see, somehow we have come up with this judgmental universal law that says you can't be the superhero of your life because your status is less than. And I think that is so viral in all of us where we yeah. cannot appreciate who we are and where we are. Because I'll tell you, Paul, if if for the first 40 years of my life, if I was not fully focused and dedicated to the purpose of the moment that I was in, whether it was cleaning fish at a fish counter and hanging octopus up in the cage for holiday season and smelling like fish most of the time, right? Whatever I did, there was a sense about it but we're confused. Now, cleaning fish was not going to be my life's purpose. By the way, I almost lost my finger. Clearly, that was not a skill for me. But we have to help people hold on. And we have to help them imagine. And I wanted to talk to you about that antiviral. Yeah, because I, I can have to talk have about this. Yeah. Okay. yeah, what I, you know, because I... I work with a lot of people. I have a private practice and all mm -hmm. these groups and classes and stuff. And invariably with everybody, it comes down to everybody has this, you know, creative part and, oh, I have this vision, this dream. But then invariably it gets right to that edge of, oh, what's stopping you? You know, what's the story that you've internalized? Oh, I'm not good enough. Oh, I'll be judged. Oh, you know, it won't be perfect. There's a litany of stories, and but then we invest those stories with the reality, and that's where we're colluding with Watiko. And what I'm pointing out is that when you really shed light on those stories, they're a lie. They're not true in the moment. And if you're able, and what I've learned as a creative person, 
when I sit down, because every morning is when I write, and when I sit down to write, invariably, I feel this incredible resistance every morning, but I've learned to not get seduced by it, to not indulge it. And, and then, you know, I just find myself and I'm in my writing and, and it vaporized. But um, what I've learned is that the greater the resistance, the greater the potential breakthrough if you stay with it, you know, and, and just to associate for a second, there was a number of years ago where, you know, I have these teachers, these great um, spiritual teachers from Tibet, and I would be going to them and I was really struggling, you know, there was a lot of trauma in my life and abuse and wounding. And so every time I would be sharing with them the pain I was in and the suffering and, and you know, these demons and the dark forces. And one day they said to me something that I'll never forget. They said, Paul, it's because you have such potential for light that the demons are even interested. Okay. And now that recontextualizes yeah. everything, not just for me, but that's our, that's everyone's experience. And all of a sudden then, if you're feeling these obscuring demonic forces that are wanting, you know, that are stopping you, you know, from, you know, fulfilling your mission, instead of just interpreting it like, you know, pathologizing yourself and feeling, wow, I'm really screwed up. No, you, now I understand. I can interpret it like, wow, I'm clearly on the right path. Of course, these demons are coming, wanting, you know, attacking me because they're threatened, because I'm so close to connecting with the light. So then I see it as like, actually, wow, this is like catalyzing me to continue and take to take the next step. It's fascinating. Um, I, I think I mentioned during the break that I work with women all walks of life. And what I found was a common denominator to really to really understand each other was through things that that people do. Movies, films, television series, things that if you're working with a group of people, books that they're reading, they could agree upon. And what I love about it is when you pick something that's benign, and what I mean by that is the movie's not about you, unless it is about you, but it's not really. There's a way that we can project and really take a deeper look at things. And what's so fascinating about where we are now is we have an explosion of digital material. And yet, I know I'm going to get an email about this. And yet, even with all the digital platforms, Facebook, right, we needed one more because Watiko could not hang out in those other places so well anymore. So we had to create another one that allowed people to be more raw, that allowed a different side of people, that allowed something that wasn't being done in the gazillion other social media platforms, and that's TikTok. And it's fascinating to see how we keep regenerating, regenerating, regenerating. Shadow, light, shadow, light, shadow, light, shadow, light. Can we get yeah. to the light without the shadow? Yeah, well, the thing is, the light, like the Kabbalah points out again and again, you know, they have a phrase, the, the descent on behalf of the ascent, is <laughs> that the light, the true light, is to be found in the shadow. Yep. You know? So it's like, instead of in the time of Christ, where like God is coming down from the heavens yeah. through, you know, light. No, God is coming up. It's called, you know, the, the hidden God, the, the, the dark God, the Dies Epsconditus, where it actually is emerging from the underworld, you know, through our unconscious, through the shadow, that the shadow is this revelation. It's revealing. It's what I was saying before that, you know, it's not just that that light mm -hmm. reveals darkness, but that mm -hmm. light is revealed through the darkness. And that's, you know, the Gnostic understanding, the alchemical understanding, that's wisdom. Yeah. And that's what's happening when you see this, what's happening in the greater body politic of our world. When you see it from like a higher point of view, you understand, oh yeah, there is things look terrible from one superficial dimension, all this evil and madness, but potentially encoded in that, we are potentially awakening. And I say potential because that's very that's quantum, a quantum term because everything is in potentiality, you know, exists in a state of potentiality in the quantum world. And and the idea being is that we are the co-dreamers of what's happening. What's going to happen? Are we going to continue to be because it's not just like we're unconscious. It's as if 
there is some sort of negative energy that's trying to keep us asleep. And mm -hmm. I'm just trying to point light on that because that's what takes away its power, you know? And so the question is, are we going, are we terminally ill, like you had quoted that title of my chapter, or are we waking up? And that's yet to be seen. But I'm really on the side of, no, we, we already are awake, you know, and we can just remember that, remember who we are, connect with other people who are doing that. Then it, we can conspire to co-inspire each other. That's a conspiracy theory. We can activate this genius, the collective genius that gets, you know, online and, and activated when enough of us come together who are awakening. That's the, the antiviral for the mind virus. Mm -hmm. I love it because you really bring it back again when you talk about the coronavirus, because then you ask the question a different way. Uh, does the coronavirus inspire optimism or pessimism? Yeah, yeah, right? no, it's exactly. That's another way of saying it. And the danger is if we get caught in pessimism, then being dreamlike, we're gonna attract to ourselves all the evidence confirming our pessimism and it becomes a self-generating feedback loop whose origin is our own mind. But here's where I want to bring in quantum physics, because quantum physics is saying, hey, you have the this universe is made of quantum entities, which actually exist in a state of potentiality. Any and every way they could potentially manifest, they exist in that potential state until the moment that we observe them then they actualize into one particular manifestation and all the other potentialities. They just vaporize in these parallel worlds as if they never existed. But what the founding fathers of quantum physics, quantum physics were saying was that even if one of those potentialities is highly ridiculously unlikely, it could still manifest, be the one that manifests this very moment. Mm -hmm. And when you realize that, for example, the idea or the actuality of our species actually waking up sufficiently and having a global awakening, the quantum physicists would say, oh, that's absolutely within the realm of possibility. And if you're not investing your attention in that, then what are you thinking? Then you're unwittingly serving the darkness. Wow. Paul, thank you so much for today. I know you've got to run, but before you go, please let folks know how they can get a copy of your book and also how they can find out more about you. Sure. Well, I'm just hoping that my book is available in every bookstore throughout the, the multiverse, mm -hmm. all the different <laughs> galaxies. And if they want to contact me or, you know, whatever, or, or see all these articles or other interviews, they should just go to my website, um, awakeninthedream.com. And like I was saying, I'm so much of it is just for free. It's not monetized really at all. I mean, you know, if they want to buy an autographed copy, I'm happy to do that. But I just want to get this information out because people, so many people are, are you know, getting incredible benefit. And um, that's why I'm just wanting to share this with everyone. So thank you so much. Yeah, I have one last question. I'd love to know your personal message and what you'd like to leave us with today. Yeah. And that is that, you know, there's no there's no reason um, to feel despondent or depressed or pessimistic or anything like that, that the fact that the darkness is so intense in our world, you know, that's an expression that an incredibly strong light is really nearby. And if you focus on the darkness, you're going to like I'm saying, you're just going to create all the confirmation proving you know, the objective reality of your point of view, and then you're taking yourself down. There's no one else who's doing that. But if you actually see, oh, wow, this is like triggering me and touching different parts of me, what's that about? And all of a sudden, instead of focusing on the, because Watiko works through distracting us and putting our attention outside of ourselves, but if then we actually place our attention in what inside of us is being triggered and touched, that becomes a doorway to deepen our connection with who we are. Mm. And so it's actually an incredible opportunity for us, you know, to, to really deepen our awakening, connect with our creativity and connect with each other. And, you know, in essence, one final thing, the Watiko virus is really in essence, it's a misidentification of who we think we are. We, if we think we're a separate self, as soon as I'm identified with being a separate self, then you're an other. As soon as you're an other, there's fear, and then if I indulge in that fear, that's the superfood for Watiko. Then I'm feeding Watiko. But if we actually see the dreamlike nature 
And you, so you're a dream character in my dream. I'm a dream character in, in your dream. And then to see the dreamlike nature is to actually snap out of the imagination that we exist separate from each other and to recognize the actuality of our yeah. situation, that we're interconnected, we're interdependent. The expression of that is an open heart filled with compassion. That's the medicine that dissolves Watiko. So that would be my, my final thing. Yeah, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Paul, for joining us. For sure, uh, totally. Yeah, thank you all for tuning us in and turning us on. And one of the things I'm really struck by, let me leave you with this. Um, there have been people that have inspired us. Some of them you may know, some of them you may not. Some of them have made it to quite high levels of notoriety. Some of them have made it to those levels, but you really don't know who they are. And I want to leave you with this. They don't have anything different than you or me or Benny or Jacob or any of us. Every one of us has that level to create and imagine. You can be your own Stan Lee. You can be your own person of astonishment. You can do that. And to quote, you know, a friend of mine and colleague of mine, do something outrageous each day to remind yourself of how creative you are. And remember, be of service and fill your tank first. We'll see you next time.